thank you for staying around for what I'm sure is going to be a really interesting panel. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ed Delp, who is the Charles William Harrison, Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, and Professor of Psychological Sciences. Um, and Ed is, you know, similar to Al, Ed has had a long and distinguished career uh, with a number of pioneering innovations in the image and video processing area. Um, in case you haven't noticed, Ed's also quite outspoken, <laughs> right? Just in case you haven't noticed, right? Which uh, at times can be, uh, you know, it can, it can be quite imp intimidating, but after 18 years of having the pleasure of being a colleague with him, uh, you know, I know what a fantastic, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> I didn't hear that. Only if you're an administrator. <laughs> Which I'm not. So, you know, I've had the pleasure of, uh, I guess, being on his good side and uh, en enjoying uh, the pleasure of uh, many conversations with him. So, I'm going to turn it over to Ed to introduce the other panelists and take it away from here. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so, the panelists today, of course, we have Dr. Bovik. Um, we also have. Uh, Chi Guao, Guao from, uh, he's an assistant professor of ECE. You wonder, there he is right next to me. Um, we have uh, Maggie Zhu, who is an associate professor of ECE. Uh, we have Greg Buzzard, who's a professor of mathematics. And we have Melba Crawford, who is a distinguished professor in the civil engineering uh, department. Um, I should point out uh, two of the people on, on, on this panel, myself and Melba, have known Al for a long time. And if you were here when he began his talk, Maybe I can tell you later about his drug dealer comment that he made <laughs> uh, about when we were, we were in the jungle in Belize, and it really was a drug dealer we ran into. Um, okay, so the, the main goal, and I, the panelists are not going to have any statements. And the main goal um, is of this panel is really to engage Professor Bovik and ask him questions. So maybe to start off, uh, maybe Melba, I'll let you ask the first question. Okay. I should have, I should have told you that, no, but I, I didn't. Know, there's number four here. I know, but why don't you start off? Okay, so I'm not going to ask you civil engineering questions. Microphone. Oh, Excuse me. good. It's on. It's on. Okay. So we've known each other a very long time. Yes. The first time that Dr. Bovic came into my office at the University of Texas, he bent over to come in. And that was my introduction. Um, so one of the first, so we've had uh, engagement professionally as well with the IEEE, and many of you are probably in the IEEE. Um, and so in the imaging area where I was working more in applications and certainly not video, um, but we were both going to the same big conference, the big ICAST conference. We said, this is such a drag. There's so many people there. You have 10, 12 parallel sessions. What are we going to do in order to actually have a community that can engage in a meaningful way? So we said, we'll start a conference. And we'll have about 200 people there. <laughs> yep. And so we got our friends together, and we had this conference uh, in Austin. And we had a couple of parallel sessions. And this conference has continued for how many years now? 20? Well, that was 92, I guess. So you know, going on 30 years. Yeah. And it, it 94? is... 94, I guess. Was it? And we okay. said, we're going to make it totally about... 92 or 94? 94, yeah. <laughs> totally so 29, 29 years. Yep. And we're going to make it international, <clears throat> international conference on image processing. It's still 200 people, right? Oh, that was where I was getting to. <laughs> so we, it was so popular that now it's got, I don't know how many thousand people that typically attend. And it's like going to CVPR, where you have people standing up around the outside of the, the room. So how do we professionally engage, you know, because it's really important. Almost everybody here, I think, is a student. How do we engage students? You know, being at a conference, that's the whole value of a conference, is really the engagement. Um, and so what are your thoughts on that as we, we move forward? Sure. Well, you know, COVID was very revealing in this regard, right? Because we all stopped going to conferences in person. And then we did this, you know, sort of online thing <laughs> where, you know, to be honest, 
you know, you probably attended very little of the conference. Maybe you saw a talk or something. Which and was pre-recorded. Which typically. was typically pre-recorded. Yeah, right. And, you know, you certainly didn't interact with anybody, which means you didn't bounce ideas and you didn't, you know, have a personal connection. You didn't form new research relationships or, or anything like that. So to me, that just first of all, that in-person aspect is absolutely unassailably perfect. You know, I think, you know, during COVID also, multiple of my graduate students who were normal kids, you know, would have been happy and so on, had to go through therapy and so on because of their feelings of isolation during COVID. I, mean, I couldn't see them. They couldn't see each other. They couldn't be in the lab or anything else. And that's just sort of going the opposite direction. You know, it's important that we are social creatures. We need to come together to learn, to co-educate, to, to advance knowledge as one. Now, the size of it, you know, that just reflects the importance of pictures and videos because they're everywhere. It's in your pocket. I mean, just everything is pictures and videos today. And we can't cancel that out, okay? Um, I think some sort of, you know, combination of things is starting to happen because, um, you know, there was also proliferation of conferences. So right. there's the gigantic, you know, conferences, and, but then there's suddenly 500 other image processing conferences too. I think that they're going to start to, you know, dwindle because of Zoom and so on. Maybe they'll go online and that sort of thing. I think we'll still have the ICAST. We'll have ICIP, CVPR, and a few others as well. And they'll be big, and we'll just have to learn how to accommodate because we need to send our students to those more than anything. I mean, I like to go too, especially if it's a nice place. I want to find Ed there and shoot the bull and talk about society matters and research and everything else. But students, I remember going to conferences as a student and I was, instead of being like now old and, you know, walking around jaded, you know, and just like hadi ta, I was bullet interested in every one of those posters and talks. I sat through the talks. I was interested. I asked questions, you know, and I really was really engaged. And that, I think, is, was so important for my own personal development that let's not give that up no matter what. That's what I think. And don't be intimidated when you go to a conference. Don't ask, you know, because if I'm up there giving a talk, I mean, I just had, you know, about five or six students come talk to me. For me, that was the best part of the talk. My ability to, you know, afterward, somebody was interested I enough to I thought the best part was talking to me. <laughs> Second best. Second best. Second best. Because we are educators, first and foremost. Yeah. Okay? That was the best because somebody listened. Somebody understood something, if not the whole thing, and somebody was interested and asked an intelligent question. So that, for me, was thrilling to ask, answer those questions. So, well, do the students have any questions they'd like to ask Professor Bovic? I mean, we have some other ones we can continue to ask. But does anybody have, and don't hesitate if you just stand up and ask a question. Anybody want to ask a question? Including, you might want to ask a question about his career path and why did he end up at the University of Texas, if you're interested in that. Does anybody have any? Okay, go ahead. He's got one back there. Back, with, back here. Go ahead. Okay, wait a minute. There's a, we'll get, but there's another question over here. Uh, so I don't know if you covered this in the um, lecture, but... Why did, you, why did you receive two Emmys? Oh, well, you know, to be honest, um, you know, I was working on uh, foveated vision. That's where we account for the fact that your eye has, you know, more sensors in the middle of, you know, the retina. So when I'm looking at you, you're in focus, but everybody else is blurry, okay? But in creating, trying to do foveated compression, we didn't have a quality model. So I was searching for a quality model. So myself and Joe Wong, one of my greatest students, uh, we got together and we started talking about it. And I proposed, and he was saying, this mean squared error isn't working. And I said to him, why don't you just make it local? You know, measure it locally and normalize it. Okay, and that became the structure term. He went home and came back the next day with the other two terms. Okay, and so we had our model and it worked and we were puttering along and suddenly the television people started picking up on it because it actually correlated much more highly with human judgments than anything ever before. And it kind of ran with itself, but of course we became opportunistic as well and tried to engage companies. A company called Video Clarity started marketing it to the world. Yeah. We gave them all our code, helped them send a student there to help them and so on. But then it kind of took care of itself, you know, and at one point it was just SIM, S-S-I-M I think a lot of people call it, was, you know, controlling more than half of all the moving bits at some point, you know. Yeah. So Maybe you go back to Amy's question. Why did you choose to go to the University of Texas? Well, you know, I went to school in Champaign-Urbana, okay, and uh, um, not, to, not to belittle your weather here, 
<laughs> no, just kidding. I did kind of get sick as a kid of you know, the snow and slush and so on. I, wanted, I liked hot weather. But more importantly than that, Austin at the time was perceived as, you know, the hot spot of the future. I didn't want to go to California, too crowded and all that. East Coast, too crowded. I wanted to go someplace that was hot, sunny, fun, and a dynamic environment. They had these initiatives called MCC and, and uh, what was the other one? I forget, you know. Uh, but anyway, it was, it, you know, huge amounts of money That's pouring in. Stuff. Hmm? There's, a, there's, another, there's another one of these semiconductor things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 SMC. SMC, yeah. SMC and so on. And Semitech. Semitech, thank, thank you. That That's the morning. one, yeah. Thank you, Semitech. thank you, David. Yeah. Semitech. So you know, and I went down there, and you know, I loved the town, and so on. So it was my number one target all along, and I went there, and it's been great, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and the outdoorsy place, you know, it's a lot of outdoor activities and warm. I liked hot, you know. Now I'm not so hot on hot because it's 105 <laughs> of us all summer. I got to tell you, I'm getting sick of that, you know. But, <laughs> so, uh, do any of the other students have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll we'll ask one of the panelists to ask a question. Now, I should mention that Thomas Wong said, "Al, Austin has a great future." So I listen to him a lot. You know. Okay. Do you have a question, David? Sure. Go ahead. I think it's on. Hello? Okay. So, when I was in graduate school, you hated the mean square error, and I still think that you don't like it. Do you dislike it as much as then, or more, or less? I love the mean square error. <laughs> <laughs> He's what you've mellowed with age. No, no, I, it's just that I didn't like it being used for picture quality prediction, because it's such a horrible predictor, okay? So I didn't, you know, make comparisons with it, because it's not worth it anymore. But I mean, literally, the correlations are below the worst picture quality prediction algorithm by big margin. Uh, it just doesn't have any perceptual aspect. It's just a pixel-to-pixel -pixel comparison, which doesn't account for perceptual principles like masking effects and, and so on. So, so did you have yeah. David in, in the class? Uh, I don't know. You take my class? class? Yeah, you took processing. image processing. So DSP, I, yeah, see, I used to so teach how, DSP. How was he? He was good. He was very good, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he said he liked the math. I remember he said, I like the math. Oh, so okay. It turned okay. out he's right. Right. He was my PhD advisor for like a semester or two. Yeah, just, you know, I was sort of oh, standing. You were, you were the br he was the bridge there. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Otherwise, you ask a question. Sure. Um, so uh, my research is about uh, jointly designing hardware and software for uh, future cameras or visual sensors. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask you from a perspective of hardware maker that's uh, from... Um, the perspective of video quality preservation, do you have any uh, feedback or wish list for hardware makers to mm -hmm. make their next generation cameras? For example, is there an aspect that you wish cameras to improve on? For example, like higher resolution or higher dynamic range mm -hmm. uh, or flexible frame rate, as you have mentioned in the talk, mm -hmm. um, or things like that? Well, two things about camera technology. One, it's amazing at all the different camera technologies and their capabilities along every dimension, including the ones you all mentioned, the spatial resolution, temporal, you know, bit depth, you know, everything. Okay, so that advanced tremendously. Another thing is that camera manufacturers are incredibly secretive. Okay, so it's very hard to know what's going on inside a camera computationally. Okay, they because it's so competitive field, you know, and they're in addition, they're having to compete with the iPhone, right? So it's even more competitive. I mean, you certainly don't find out much like that unless, you, like Ed, you know, he does legal cases and, and you know, sees the secrets. Um, I do see them. He sees the secrets, you know. Yes, I've seen them too, so I know. I can't, 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 can't tell you. I can't tell him either. So, <laughs> but, but, so, but, but don't you, I'm sorry, but don't you think some of this computation they're doing in the camera uh, in some ways um, degrades the quality? Well, it can. I mean, what I can tell you is the iPhone does use quality models like this. Okay, that much I know through, I'm not going to reveal how I know. <laughs> but it wasn't through a patent case, okay? So they're injecting, you know, perceptual optimization. Um, I think it's great that they're doing that because it's something that can be done fast and efficient and be put in, you know, just hardwired, you know, just write hardwire code and that sort of thing. Uh, as opposed to relying upon, you know, deep learning and that sort of thing. I think they can coexist, but it's a difficult problem to talk about how you can, you know, put in that neural process, which they do, along with the, you know, sort of net, net, you know, standard type processors. But how do they not only coexist, but how do they also co-process? 
the visual, the visual information. That, you know, I think is kind of a challenge. Going forward, just as it is conceptually, how do we combine, you know, machine learning, which is just this big black box that can optimize anything with the right data, with science and truth. Today I talked about science and truth, okay, which ought to be able to make deep models better. So how we, I'd like to see how those things can, you know, coexist. As far as all the improvement along all these various dimensions, boy, they're on top of that, you know, I mean, which makes, makes my job interesting because then I can develop a model for, well, high frame rate or, you know, better colors or, you know, whatever new dimension comes along. By the way, is, is there any questions? Because I was going to follow up on that. So, you know, there's this, I don't know what I want. Philosophical argument or what that, you know, we take the picture and we look at the picture, um, but that's really not telling us what effectively is out there in a sense. You, you, do, do you understand what I'm saying is, number one, the sensors we have uh, only sense in certain wavelengths. And we know other animals maybe have other sensors. So maybe we're not perceiving the real scene. We're perceiving some version of the scene. And, and, um, and then on top of that, we got all this processing going on inside the camera. Is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is that a good thing? Is, uh, well, what you just said is not only true of cameras, it's true of our own eyes. Right, of course. Okay, because, you know, we have a limited range of you know bandwidths we see the brain is immediately compressing like i talked about throwing away huge amounts of information because of that you know it's still we still see well but people think when you look at the world or you take a picture with a camera okay that well i got everything okay but there are enormous number of visual illusions that just show you how little you're actually seeing when you're looking at the world. I don't mean other bands like IR or you know, x-rays or that sort of thing. But they're important you know. too. They are important, absolutely, especially in remote sensing. You know? And by the way, these models work for those Well, I, that's my next question. Okay, well, I'll hold off on that. Okay, so you know, in fact, you know, the brain is doing, just like deep learning, enormous amount of, in the broadest sense, extrapolation and interpolation to understand. That's why visual illusions fool people, because the brain is trying to figure out, what is it? It's trying to figure out, how does this fit into the real world? And it makes, you know, these special designs that so makes wrong answers. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the audience? From the students? Any type of question? Okay. All right. If not, Professor Zhu. Hi. Um, Hi, Maggie. <laughs> Hi, Al. Um, so I want to ask a question uh, kind of related to quality and compression because I do, you know, some research in that area, um, particularly with compression. Um, so I think um, in your talk, you know, you also talk about uh, your collaboration with these companies. They're always trying to push the boundaries of how much we can compress the data, right? But still having the best quality, right? So there's always this trade-off between, you know, what we call the rate and distortion or rate and quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think you have covered a lot about uh, from the human perception point of view, right? And how we view this as to uh, whether it's giving us the good quality we like to consume. Um, I think there's also a lot of emerging trends where um, this massive amount of visual data that we have acquired are processed machines, right? Which do not, uh, mimic our human vision. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, do you uh, think quality in that sense for data that are processed by machines still plays a role and then what might that role be? Oh sure. I mean uh, you, there are definitely studies and we conducted one not long ago that show that you know machine vision tasks number one are affected by picture quality. Okay so doesn't matter, you know, how big a deep network you have and so on. If the pictures coming in are of lower quality, then it's going to have a harder time doing recognition and that sort of thing. Um, another study we did was just in face detection, okay? Suppose you take a powerful face detector. It doesn't have to be a big, huge, deep thing, something like what's in your camera, Viola Jones-type face detector. If you also supply that algorithm with some quality features, okay, that are, you know, like what I just talked about today, then it can do a better job at detecting faces because it can learn to account simultaneously for detecting faces as well as 
accounting somehow for the quality of the picture and how that might affect the detectability of faces. Okay, so very much so you can include that. Now with that said, you know, if you have gigantic databases, like ImageNet is full of distorted pictures. So to some degree, if you're, you know, if you, when you're training on ImageNet to do image recognition, it is learning not only to do image recognition or classification, I should say, but doing it on distorted pictures. So it has to learn structural things like the models I talked about, okay? The under, I mean, deep models, the early layers of deep models look very much like the same bandpass filters I've been talking about, okay? They learn the same things that your visual brain does and does that. But also further in, and I don't have proof of this because it's further into the network where nobody understands anything, you know, explainability, but certainly if it's learning distortion, I mean, to, at least to the extent of being able to classify in the presence of distortion, it's learning that, the natu that these statistics are modified in some way. You know, how it's learning, it may be not explicit, but very implicit somehow. You know, somewhere in the embedding, which is my favorite word in machine learning, is embedding. Okay, you know, well, what's at the seventh layer? Well, it's the embedding. Okay, what does that mean? Oh, it's just, I thought it was the feature. Well, well that's the embedding now. Uh, it's a much cooler word they've come up with. So. Okay, I got yeah, it. Yeah, feature got map it. is an embedding. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I think that deep models can learn it along with their task. But if you can inject this information, this basic truth in there, then it can learn it faster, converge better, you know, smaller models, that sort of thing, very definitely, you know. Um, you know, Jitendra Malik, you know, he's kidding with me one time. He said, well, all this stuff you do is cool, and all this stuff I do is cool as computer vision. You know, we're all doing cool stuff right now, but, you know, at one point it's going to be a big box replaces this, you know. Uh, you know, is that going to be true? I don't know. I hope not. You know, I'll be retired by then and won't care in the same well, way. Well, <laughs> following, following up on that, so how about if you take the attitude, the hell with it. I don't need the camera. I'll just generate. And I could even... I could even uh, send you the parameters uh, over the internet so you could generate the movie. Hmm. Then, then I'm not going to have any quality issues, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to say two things just about forget the quality. Okay. Yeah. Number one, and I, I, my kids went through the teen years during the Marvel era at the peak, and I am just so sick of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take them to every single Marvel. I've seen 23 more, whatever it is now at this point, you know, Marvel movies. Okay, and there's so much generative stuff there. And, and it's such a relief to go see real people acting and talking and, you know, well, and emphasizing point? quality of acting. Second thing is, you can't watch the news that's been generated, videos. Oh, news that's videos. Coming. That's coming. News videos can't be generated. <laughs> that's coming. I mean, they might be generative with generated oh, with my evil. Dear, my dear friend, that's coming. Well, with malintent, perhaps. Yes. Generated with coming. malintent. It's definitely coming, but the real news, the honest news, can't be generated. Okay? So I mean these are just two examples but, I mean, of but things. What, Certainly what, cinema you can generate, maybe the actors will all disappear, you know. Right. But do we believe that you know, a machine learning system anytime in the near future can convey the sensitivity of a Meryl Streep in representing some sort of you know, uh -oh. personal expression, attributes, nervousness, you know, that sort of thing. I think we're far away from it. No, we're not. <laughs> well, we are. We are. But, but, but I agree with you more than, than I don't. But I, I think the, the, the problem is there's a lot of people that are sort of taking this attitude that you know, we're going to have all this generated content and I maintain all this generated content is not good for our society either. And beyond, beyond the image processing implications, I think it's not good for our society. Yeah, I mean, you could probably have a generative model that could learn Jack Nicholson. Yes. Okay, with his peccadillos and strange behavior. I mean, just the way he is a wonderful actor. But it can't create the next Jack Nicholson with that actor's incredible, you know, peccadillos and strange attributes and mannerisms and things and so on that would make that actor great and unique and so on, you know? It can't create Marlon Brando, can't create Meryl Streep, can't create, you know, Betty, you know, let, whatever. Let, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not impressed so far. Uh, uh, neither am I, but I'm just gonna say, let's see what happens. Is there any questions from the audience here? Back there. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, it might have been mentioned in the first part of the talk, but, uh, as a visual scientist, uh, what would you say the top features of the human perception that is currently missing in the machine perception? And what are the possible directions that, you know, that research should go to incorporate that? 
Well, my okay. viewpoint is, you know, I'm constantly reading the visual science literature and also doing research in just visual neuroscience at times. I mean, I spent a good part of my career just publishing in vision science journals and that sort of thing, trying to see what new discoveries are forthcoming that I can bring into video engineering. Whenever I find one that I might think might be useful, like, you know, major things have been like foveation, natural scene statistic models, you know, things like that, adaptive gain control, all these kind of things. When I find them, I try to bring them into some kind of algorithm, okay? I mean, why do, why is, you know, the word have this, why, do, let me give you this example. Uh, this is going the other direction to your question, but I think it's just too interesting. So I never answered the question to the audience of why does the visual system of the human brain extract, do the same processing that extracts that Gaussian noise? Why? Okay? And the answer in my mind is so that it can perceive distortion. So for example, you know, the crystalline lens of your eye adapts to bring things into focus. Okay? And it does it using process in visual cortex here. So when you change the degree of focus, it's changing the statistics of what is being perceived back here and adapting until you just get that right focus at that point in your depth of field, okay? I think it's using this Gaussian noise to control it, basically, okay? I know that was in kind of the opposite direction. What about so conserving my, energy, too? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, conserving energy in the sense that of, you know, the, you know, the bandpass processing and everything becomes efficient and, and that sort of thing because, you know, it's not, it's, it's you know, let me put it this way. If we didn't have just foveation, then we'd have to carry our brains in a wheelbarrow, okay? If our whole field of view is the same resolution, okay? If we mound upon that, if we didn't have this upfront reduction of excess information by encoding, then, you know, we'd have to, you know, use a very, very large wheelbarrow to cart our brains around, so, okay? So, and remind. all that, is, processing all the information, of course, is, you know, expensive and sure. consumes heat and all that kind of stuff, you know? Remind people what you mean by foveation. Well, foveation, again, is, you know, when you're reading here, you know, I can see the word compression here, but I can't read any of the words around it when, I, my, when my eye is pointed there. That's because if you take your retina and if you laid it flat, then right in the middle is a very high resolution of the, you know, the, the cone cells primarily, the photoreceptors, okay? And then when you move away from the center, the fovea, it gets, falls out very fast, so it's much sparser sampling, okay? So it's, what you're seeing out here in what's called the visual periphery is subsampled, okay? And it's really amazing because what do the eyes do? I mean, everything's blurry except you. How do I see Amy? I move my eyes. So we have this fabulous feedback control system of visual attention moving around quickly, sometimes pointedly, to what I need to see and allocate all my visual resources towards what I want to look at, whether it's Charlie or whether it's Amy or someplace else. When I'm driving constantly, you're saccading your, your point of gaze around the visual field. Super efficient to do that. But your perception is you've you got a very high quality, high resolution scene in front of you even though it's really only what you're effectively looking at. What I would say is you have a high resolution in an area about the width of your thumb. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one degree of visual angle, same size as the moon. But you have the rest with you know, declining resolution. All that context is important. So you want to, you're driving, you know, if you turn right soon, you see a fuzzy building in your periphery, but you know, you're, you know there's a street sign, there's a road there. You, and then you point your gaze towards it, you know exactly how to turn, okay? So it's all important. You need the peripheral information as well as that little area of high resolution. But it's absolutely amazing the way we develop that. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's microphone. Can I just speak loudly? It's coming. Well, Charlie's it <laughs> not a patient. I know he's not a patient. <laughs> okay. Darla, okay. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I have a thought. I mean, we had a distinguished lecture, I think, last year. It was Bill Freeman, you know Bill oh, Freeman. Yeah. yeah, and um, he gives a talk where he talks about wings versus feathers. Maybe you've seen this? No, I haven't oh, seen okay. that. Okay, it's, it's an interesting concept. So the idea is that a wing is intrinsic to flight, but feathers are an adaptation that, like, you know, birds have that work, okay? But not bats. Uh, um, that's true. And then that would be an example. So in other words, some things are useful but not necessary, whereas other things must be there. And for vision you know, uh, the, quest the questions he's raising are which things do we think are, 
our, our wings and which are feathers. So, so my question is, are, is foveation wings or feathers? Do you think it's something that's really impressive that humans develop because of their limitations? And, or because we're not really using foveation that much in real vision systems. We, I, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, uh, but you know, or, or is it you just collect all the data and don't worry about it and just have a computer the size of a building? <laughs> well, keep in mind, you know, there's a computational advantage of electronics over our brain, okay? So, I mean, what we have is massive parallelism, okay, but we're a very slow processor. So, you know, every, you know neurons fire in the microsecond scale. It's nothing like, you know, what's available in, in, in computers. So, there has to be other efficiencies, and foveation is one of them, and I would call it absolutely a wing. Uh, in fact, every, you know, creature, you know, who has a complex eye, has some sort of fovea to allocate visual resources in that way. Like horses have horizontal foveas. And the reason why is, well, you know, they have these, you know, eyes that are looking outward across the plane. They want to see whatever prey are coming their way, and they don't care what's in the sky. Eagles don't attack horses, you know, they don't care, you know, snakes they just stomp on, you know, whatever. But whatever, you know, whatever is in that one field of view that's horizontal, all the way across the field of view is their fovea and where they're the region of interest, you know. And there's other shape phobias too, amazingly, yeah. There's a question in the back. Oh, I'm sorry, right here? All right, why don't we particularly you go first and then we'll have the gentleman in the back. Um, hi, Dr. Bovik. Hello. Um, so, uh, because Gaussian distribution came up and also in your lecture you mentioned that um, if the image is poor quality, it's far from the Gaussian point, and if it's good, it's near the Gaussian point. So does that mean that the underlying distribution of images or videos, the spatiotemporal distribution is Gaussian? Um, and if not, then why do we uh, relate it to the Gaussian point, the Gaussian distribution point? Yeah, so again, you know, if you look at an image and calculate its distribution, it's very non-Gaussian generally, right? Because you can have any shape histogram, basically. It's only after you do this reduction by a bandpass process, okay, re remove the extraneous information, separate, it may not be useless, used for something else, okay, that you end up with this Gaussian residual, okay? Why is that true of pictures and videos of the world? That is a mystery still. It is not because of something like the central limit theorem. It's not an additive effect that creates that underlying Gaussianity in the world. So it's a bit of a mystery. It's another one of the magical things about you know, the Gaussian, Gaussianity of the world. But what I can say is, so we don't know why it's true. It's wonderful that it's true. Um, but, you know, again, the vision system, whatever the distribution of the world would be, a neural network, what does a neural network do? Okay, statisticians will tell you, or they'll say, well, basically, it learns distributions, especially a generative model, okay? It's just learning to create a, images having a distribution of whatever signal, okay? So it's learning distribution. So this neural network, the same thing, it learned the distribution of the natural world, okay, which has this underlying Gaussianity. The neurons and the various brain centers that I pointed out, they learn to extract that Gaussianity and separate it from the signal structure, which can be used for recognition, classification, navigation, and that. So the, the brain separates those while also achieving high efficiencies in, through encoding. And it does it by the same processing, which is kind of miraculous in itself, okay? That by doing efficient encoding, you separate into this noise signal. Well, nobody, one, you know, nobody knew what to do with the noise signal. Uh, my thought is, well, for algorithms, let's do quality prediction, and I think the brain does that too. So, so my speculation, and it would come over here, about why we do this, I think it goes back to efficiency and survivability. And survivability. And sure. survivability. In other words, you know, you need that level of vision that can give you that, that resolution when you need it, and you can focus it so you won't get eaten by something. Oh, absolutely true, you know. Yeah. Just like our, you know, our color responses. We see more strongly in the green-yellow range because we have a yellow sun and we, a lot of things you can eat that are green, okay? And, uh, red is important. Well, oh, I'm bleeding, you know, and <laughs> or red berries are edible and that sort of thing. And, you know, our blue sensitivity is much reduced because it's not as important for survivability. Occasional blueberry and laying back in your grass and looking at the blue sky, okay, and relaxing. So, you know, same, you know, we, the neural system adapts for survivability, of course. Yeah, definitely. 
Okay, we have a student back there. Go ahead. Thank you for the great talk. So we have been talking about video quality and especially with video streaming, like quality is very important, but there comes the latency aspect as well, right? We might want to optimize for quality, but the latency might affect the human perception. So what are your thoughts about that? So when you say latency, are you saying like if you're watching a show on television and somehow it's delayed? Uh, in terms of television, but more in terms of internet streaming, let's say the chunks don't arrive in time and there's rebuffering. Oh, yeah. So, you know, video quality prediction is, you can view it as part of a broader area of research called quality of experience. A quality of experience, if you, you can include a lot of things, such as, you know, audio, um, you know, even haptics, but also, you know, temporal effects that are not distortions in the same sense, such as you're watching Netflix, suddenly because the bandwidth gets so low, the buffer in your television empties out and it freezes and you get the darn spinny in the middle, okay? And you're like, oh, you know, and then I'm going to change the channel, okay? So we've done a lot of human studies on that. Modeling that is totally different. We don't have a model for, you know, if a, if a video freezes, you know, what is the brain? Because in nature, you didn't encounter this. You know, you're out in the jungle, doesn't freeze. Oh, I see okay? those spinning wheels all the time. Yeah, I see like that. <laughs> so there's not a brain model. Instead, it becomes a behavioral model. How annoyed are you by, you know, the length of a freeze or the duration of a freeze or how often they occur? And so that's what our human studies have focused on. And we've created predictive models that are very accurate. Um, it's a bit harder because, you know, you know, they happen over long movies as opposed to short, you know, things. You have to take time in the long time spans to do these human studies. So no brain models, natural scene models like I just talked about, you know, the, the statistical models don't really apply in the same way, if at all. It's more of a behavioral thing, and so you do need machine learning for that in the end. Because, you know, we don't have a good model. We can model a freeze, okay, it's frozen. So what, that doesn't tell you much, okay? Thank you. The brain response is like, oh, it's frozen. Okay. Um, any other any other questions? Okay. David, you have okay, go ahead, David. All right. So there's a lot of interest in the tactile internet, you know, conveying tactile information, which could be converted to an image in, in some sense. Do you have any feeling if some of these tools could be used for, for assessing quality of a tactile signal? So tell me a little bit more about, okay, I'm a user of the tactile internet. What am I experiencing? So you put on gloves and it's the sensation of it's pressure, for example, or maybe something Yeah, so else it's like, it's for immersive environment. Right, yeah. It's, it's right. haptics. Yeah, so it's haptics, yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, golly, I mean, after all, this is uh, neurophysiological responses that we're experiencing, okay? You'd like those to be faithfully conveyed. So you can, first of all, in this context of what we're talking about today, certainly there is a quality of the accuracy of that. So, I mean, is my tactile experience accurate? Does it feel like I'm actually picking up a vase, okay, or something like that when I'm engaging in this immersive environment? So realism, I think it's more of a realism thing, but it could also be distortion because you're trying to transmit it over long distances, maybe that as well. So the, I think there are going to be similar, not identical, but similar kinds of issues. That said, the entire, I talked about how this, um, there's this bandpass processing and divisive normalization where you mm -hmm. basically, you know, divide by the variance signal, okay, of neighboring neurons. This isn't just a vision thing. It happens in audition, hearing, it happens in, ha in touch, it happens throughout your neurosensory system. Uh, neurons generally are normalized for that same reason of compactifying and also efficiency. Okay, so we'll use some sort of analogous models in that context as well, I think, for similar issues. Sure. Okay, maybe we would, maybe we'll go back to the panel and let's get the view of a mathematician. Go ahead, Great. Go ahead. Uh, so earlier, Ed trashed neural networks uh, in just a couple sentences. Uh, <laughs> But I wondered if you might offer a more nuanced view of like uh, what things have gone wrong, what kind of engineering or mathematical or software principles might benefit the whole neural network field and its application to video and um, images and so forth. Uh, what was the first part of the question? Um, so how might mathematics benefit machine learning? Well, sure. mathematics and engineering principles, I mean, it seems like there's kind of this gold rush and like, yeah. like people just keep throwing stuff against the fan 
and seeing right. what happens. So like what kind of principles, sort of more engineering principles or mathematical yeah, or software okay, design principles? Yeah. So, you know, a friend of mine is David Donahoe, the great statistician, okay? And, you know, last time I saw me, you know, we were talking about machine learning, and he goes, you know, Al, you know, signal processing is dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you know, I said, really? I mean, I mean, I think that people do creative things. And he goes, nah, and you know what, Al? And he's a statistician. He said, you know what? Statistics is dead, too. <laughs> and, of course, he's joking, right? Because I mean, what he's I mean, what he's saying is that you know, so many of the tasks that we've been doing with clever, you know, handcrafting and thinking and design and engineering work and so on is just being replaced by these big optimization boxes, and statistics, signal processing, and so many other places. But once again, how much creativity has been there? Well, there's been a lot, I would say, you know, and they certainly get a lot of citations. But today, it's still three basic architectures, and it was invented back in the 1980s, most of it. Okay, so I think that injecting, you know, principles of science into these things. So if you're operating in medicine, yeah, these things can find, you know, lesions and mammograms probably better than your average radiologist at this point. Okay, but if you could, under, you know, uncover the underlying, you know. Uh, physiological mechanisms of tumor formation and how they spread and they form stellate lesions and so on, then you could probably augment this learning system with that, okay? You can't expect a machine learning system, even with a billion parameters, to learn all truth about any problem, okay? So if you know truth, give it the truth, okay? That said, there's going to be challenges. I think if you're a PyTorch programmer, you know, I mean, you've got a job issue coming up, okay? Um, it's good to have, you know, learn to be a data scientist, one who can collect data, uh, who understands the science of whatever the problem is, and so you can learn how to collect data so that you can then you know, shovel it into the deep model, okay, that sort of thing. I think that's an exquisite science, you know. We find that to be so in doing psychophysical studies, okay. They're very carefully designed experimental protocols so that at the outcome, after we, we don't want to waste all those dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of people's times. We want it to be a successful outcome that will actually affect future algorithms. So, you know, it's ma mathematics. You know, mathematics, there are, you know, obviously there's a lot of branches of mathematics have nothing to do with deep learning, and they're all going to be active, but things that are affected by it, and, you know, like signal processing, a very mathematical kind of thing, one wonders, you know, to what degree a mathematician in that area is going to survive. Well, you see people trying. You see, like, Donahoe, recently had a result on a structure that always seems to appear in the final layer of a deep net, okay? It has a certain lattice structure or something like that, okay? I think slowly but surely, these kinds of thinkers will begin to dissect deep models of every variety and will begin to understand slowly but surely over time, perhaps with the assistance of our artificial friends, um, you know, what's actually happening in here. Okay. Just to explainability. Explainability. Right. Okay. Just like we only understand, we understand brain centers, and we understand coarsely what goes on where, but only in certain places do we understand, you know, enough about the brain to use it in mathematical models at this point. Maybe okay. we'll learn more about that. Any other questions from the? Yes, somebody's got their hand up. Um, there we go. <clears throat> In terms of the future of video quality, do you think about um, like creating more iPad kids and like getting children addicted and the implications of like improving this technology and just like? Well, you know, okay, if you're worried about kids, what I worry most about is, you know, augmented extended reality VR, that kind of thing. You know, iPads, pretty innocuous, you know. I mean, still, um, you know, I think kids who sit in front of a flat screen all, for many, many hours a day, I think they will tend to have less proprioceptive capability to interact with the real world. Maybe they'll be less athletic, less agile, less coordinated, less whatever uh, than kids who are outdoors playing and where their brains are adapting to, you know, flying footballs or, you know, hanging on branches and that, and that sort of thing. So I worry about, you know, extent, you know, and I, talk, I tell this to people at Meta and at YouTube, the places that are creating these kinds of devices and so on, and they've started to listen, they put warnings and that sort of thing. But I still worry about that six-year-old kid who puts on a VR helmet for six hours a day, yeah. where the content has not been perceptually corrected, geometrically, statistically, 
to agree with our real world. You know, anime, that's not real. Okay, so the, their brains are adapting to that content. And what does it do to them? I don't know, but it can't be positive. They might enjoy it, but it can't be positive. And I wonder about, you know, we're going to have stranger behaviors and, you know, deficits and, and less, less capabilities. Less critical thinking. Less, well, less, that's sort of a meta thing, you know, yeah. but less critical thinking, you know. I mean, I, I, depending on the nature of the content, you know, I won't mention politics. Uh, <laughs> from a guy from Texas. <laughs> Austin. Yeah, okay, okay, I got it. Um, okay, any other? Any, yes. Uh, thanks, Professor Bobic, for your talk. So, in visual quality, we want to correlate with human, right, human visual system. So, if we see some of the metrics, the correlation is close to, let's say, 0.9, which is really good. Do we think the 1% or 0.1 change, that is due to subjectivity of human system or human how because some of the human observer will be subjective, or there is still something missing in that truth that can be done? Well, one thing that's nice about my field that helps us create our models successfully is that when it comes to picture distortions and quality, humans generally are in high agreement. So if, I, if we create a large data set, you know, we show you know, hundreds of people, you know, thousands of distorted pictures, and we divide them into two groups, and then we correlate their opinion scores, yeah, we get very high correlations on normal pictures and videos, and maybe 0 0.95, 0 0.96, or something like that. You can view that as kind of an upper bound on performance of any predictive model. Any model that goes beyond that is overfitting, okay? Because you cannot do better than the actual humans, okay, at predicting themselves. So um, it, it doesn't make sense. Now, depending on the modality, those correlations can fall, okay? So when you start getting into the synthesized content and so on, uh, or if it's immersive, where there's many more variables, like there's so many different places you can be looking and that sort of thing, then, you know, these correlations can fall. But you're right, um, you know, the, you know the, the level of correlation depends on the situation, the content, and that sort of thing. And it's sort of an upper bound. Did I get your question? I'm, I'm wondering if I got the tail end of it. The other part of the question is like, is there something still missing in the truth probably? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, part of, the, part of what we don't include in the model I described is we don't really talk about content other than a very low level. But, you know, and there's, also, you know, there's a separate question of aesthetics. So if I show you two pictures, I suppose they have the same amount of distortion. One is a beautiful car, a little bit distorted. The other is a garbage pile. And, you know, most people will say the beautiful car picture is higher quality, okay? It's just natural, and that's what we call aesthetics. So that's a content effect, and we need to understand more about that, and that will help our models. We're doing that a little bit. We have algorithms. There's one called RAPIQ, R-A-P-I-Q-U-E. It's for blind situation, where it's got two channels. One is using a lot of these statistical things, and it's just purely distortion sensitive. The other is a semantic channel. It's just basically a pre-trained network for whatever task we're involved in. It could be just ImageNet trained. And then we feed them both to a shallow learner. Performance leaps goes up, because we learn about content too. So, yeah, that answers. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Still Lord. wide open, though. Uh, OK, I think we're going to begin to wrap this up. So maybe one more question. Does any, anybody? Have any, one more question they'd like to ask Professor Bovic? Charlie, you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> and this is honest, we'd make up something. Well, microphone. Here, Greg, here Greg gave you. Constraining, Ed. Yeah. What do you think the future is, particularly for young people in the room? Like, where is the field, are these fields going to go? Where do you think the most important directions are? And it could even be, well, maybe it should at least be science, engineering, math, but, but, but you know, it doesn't have to be restricted to your particular area of research. Oh, well, you know, it's always in trying to attack areas where we don't understand things. So I'm going to go back to the math question, okay? Yeah. How can we ever understand deep networks, okay? I believe that we have to invent a new kind of mathematics. Really. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, it's just interpolating. We can use interpolation mathematics. Or we can talk about it as statistical inferencing uh, and all that kind of thing. But really, as these models become more and more abstract, 
okay, and start to represent, you know, concepts, ideas, metaphysics, who knows what, okay, then we need some sort of symbolic mathematics that we don't currently have. And so somebody who is, and I know this is about as vague an answer as like you could oh, that's, possibly That's what for. I was looking for, vague. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, then I think, <laughs> I think that's a fascinating direction to go for mathematics to try to dispense with its current tools and try to invent new tools for this new thing, which is called these, this massive network, you know, maybe will help us understand the brain better as well. So that's an off the wall kind of answer. Otherwise, I would say, you know, don't be a PyTorch programmer. Okay, all right, because you're, there's going to be a way over abundance, half of them are going to be fired soon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, try to be have a science application in mind and try to become a person who can collect data. I know I've said that before, but you know, my students right now are all going to be in hot demand because they're all conducting human studies. They're, they become world leaders in that experience right. in being a data collection. They become a unique scientist at that point. You know? right. So you can do human studies in computer vision too. We're doing a study now of you know, how do you convert from a portrait mode to a landscape mode. Okay, well let's have humans pick the best portrait from a landscape picture. Right. If you gather a lot of data like that, and we'll, then the iPhone will do it just right like a human would like it, right? Instead of some, you know, algorithm. Yeah. Oh, thank okay, you. well, thank answer. you. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank the panel members. And most importantly, I want to thank Professor Bovic for coming here to visit us. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Al. It's My always pleasure. good to see you. It's so, a right. lot of fun. All right. Thank you for all the great questions. Fantastic. Now I can see why Purdue is such a, one of the greatest schools ever, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Great people. Yeah.